Hello, everyone. Thanks for choosing our time slot. This talk is about the next steps in the Spotify organizational model, as we call it, about the next steps in the agile way of work. It's about improvement stories from the trenches of change. And you all know, we all know in the IT world, change is hard in an agile organization. Change is hard in an agile organization. Because in the end, we all want to go to Mars, right? We all want to get there in the engineering awesomeness, in high-performing teams, high-performing developers, low attrition, uh, engineering culture, all that sweet stuff. So today, we're going to talk about a couple of concepts that we implemented in our own departments at ING that might, you, that might help you get to Mars. Well, at least it did for us, or at least remotely to Mars. So first up, it starts with you handing out developers a Mac. Because think about it. In so-called large organizations, how many of your developers work on the same laptops as your business colleagues? Something to think about. Because everything in this talk is about what we call at ING, blast radius. It's not so much about building a high-performing team here, high-performing team there. If you Google on the, on the internet, there's plenty of talks about high-performing teams. But then we haven't actually proved anything, right? It's about the department. It's about moving the average of the department. That's the blast radius. Now, before we continue to the content, a little side note. Everything in this talk is based on our own implementation in our own departments at ING. And a disclaimer, unfortunately. <laughs> sorry, no, just kidding. Everything in this talk really happens. So should you wonder along the way, is it actually implemented? Uh, are people working like this? Yes, this actually really happened. Everything in this talk got implemented. So with that out of the way, Let's go. Thanks. All right, let me introduce myself. I'm Gijs Meijer, IT lead for ING in the Netherlands. I lead the retail products. And then you've already seen him, that's uh, Martin Pakunski. He calls himself head of IT. We call it IT area lead within ING. And he uh, has been leading the daily banking domain in my team in the past uh, years. And he just moved to the mobile team, as you can see uh, here. So maybe, you know, to get a bit of the context of where we operate in, because we can tell you a beautiful story, but I think it helps if you know, but okay, what are these guys actually doing? So we, I always like to say, we are in the business of digital flows, and we are in the business of integration. So if you look within ING, if you build digital flows, and we build them for account processes, investments, consumer loans, we onboard customers, this kind of stuff, it's actually about integration. So we build flows that connect with account management systems, with party agreement systems, you know, all of the kind of systems you have in a bank. That's a bit what we do. And the main focus of our talk today is daily banking. This is where I started as an IT area lead before Marcin succeeded me. Um, and this is where we kind of triggered the change we're going to talk about today. This is a department of about 100 engineers. They work across about 25 business IT squads. And in the bigger scope of my current domain, which is retail products, it's about 450 engineers across about 100 uh, teams in five tribes. So that's a bit the context of what we do. And what is, the, what is a digital flow? It's basically an API with some web components on top that runs in our app and also in our web. So yeah, so before, let's say we go into the, into the content of this talk. Yeah, you just uh, ran out of Sanders' talk. You're just back. So we want to activate you a bit. So that, let's say, you know, you get a bit, you, you get listen very well and you learn a bit also about what we talk uh, today. So we also want to learn uh, with this experiment the knowledge in the room because we talk about some books, about some theories, and for us it's helpful to see, let's say, what you know about it. So I'd like to ask all of you to stand up and do a bit of an experiment with me. Very nice. Cool. And the experiment works actually fairly simple. So I'm going to share a bit of the, the theory or the stuff that inspired us. If you heard about it or you read about it, then you remain standing. And if not, then you, uh, you can sit down. So let's start with a simple one, the Agile Manifesto. Who dares to sit down now? <laughs> OK, so we all know that. OK, so that's where it starts. Another one, the DevOps uh, handbook. Probably you from Gene Kim and some others. Uh, probably many of you have read that. If you didn't, please uh, sit down. I see some people sitting down. Ah, oh, still considerable amount standing. Oh, okay. Great. So we are at 50% already. Great audience. Okay, so you are you will be learning something today. Then uh, Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pais with Team Topologies. Oh, we are at 30% uh, still. Okay. 
Then the book from Google about site reliability engineering. There are multiple books there. So we're about 5%, I think, last people standing. Then the book inspired by Marty Kagan about product development on tech platforms. I see an ING guy standing there still. <laughs> Another colleague. Cool. Around 10 people. OK, wow. so uh, I think we're there. So then I think you're all allowed. Uh, I missed the last one, by, by the way. Ah. The book from Netflix, No Rules Rule. OK. Now, this kind of summarizes a bit of the input we had into our journey, I think, in the last uh, year. So thanks for this. I think we're all sitting uh, now again. Perfect timing. So a bit about the journey. So also look, and this is about a way of working in ING and in, in technology. And then, you know, to know what we are doing today, it's also good to go a bit back in time. So in 2012, that was a really a super important moment for us, especially for us engineers at ING, because this is the birth of DevOps within ING. So we turned out, tore down the walls between Dev and Ops, and before that, I can tell you, you didn't want to be in IT in ING. It took like ages and tons of documents to get something to an acceptance environment and then hopefully to production at some point in time. Important moment. And then in 2015, another magic moment happened where we actually brought together business and IT. Before we had, well, reasonably well performing DevOps teams, and then we had a lot of business that would put requirements over the wall and then people would start coding. Uh, and this is where we put them together. So that's 2015. And somewhere around 2018, I had my first area lead role uh, in the analytics domain in ING. I moved to daily banking, and this is where we kind of started the improvement journey we're going to talk about today. And definitely today, we're still not on Mars. We called it our Mars mission. We're not there yet. And maybe then back to the Spotify model, because maybe not everybody here knows it that well. Um, it was actually the ING way of working model that was later called by people the Spotify model because we got inspired by Spotify. What is it? It's basically um, business and IT people sitting together in teams, and we call them then, uh, squads. So you have uh, CGEs, we call them. These are the former marketing and product management people. You have dev engineers and ops engineers that sit together in a squad. Multiple of, multiple of those squads together form a tribe, for example, mortgages or consumer loans or payments, whatever. Um, and what's really happened there is that the business got simplified. Because I still know when before I was in IT and I had my nice DevOps uh, teams, I would be talking to formula management, to product management, to communications, to uh, you name it. And now it was just business. So it's nice and they were sitting in the same uh, team. Another important uh, thing is that we introduced a chapter lead role. And the chapter lead role kind of uh, replaced um, the IT manager and also the business managers, by the way, as we had them before. And before we had these managers, they would manage 20, 25 people. And now we had people really boots on the gro ground developing code in the teams. Um, and another important thing that, that tends to be forgotten is that we moved from projects to fixed capacity. And for me, this is important because, you know, these projects, they kind of, they, they would, let's say we would have a project or a program. They would take some people out of the organization, put them together, and then we would start going. And that just, yeah, it, it did not really work. And we moved to tribes. It was more, we bring work, so this is a priority we have to work on. And then your squads start working on it. It was really a different way uh, of working. So I already mentioned some of the good and the bad stuff in here. Um, so let me summarize the good part. So it really revolutionized business IT cooperation. These business and IT people sitting together in those squads, it tore down the walls, really, of business and IT. Second part, and this was a talk Marcin talked about a few years ago here, the death of the IT manager. So we moved from IT managers, and I'm not going to say they all couldn't code, but quite a few couldn't, to IT chapter leads that would, you know, well, manage and, and inspire the engineers, but also code uh, or operate stuff in the teams. We killed project managers, as I said, and we also introduced quite some agile principles. We had a lot of agile coaches to help the teams to mature in their rituals and to become productive in flow, etc. So it was all good. But over the time, and so let's say around 2018, we have been running this for a few years, we also learned it was not all that uh, rosy. Um, so one of the things is these teams, they were two pizza-sized teams. That was the intention. So it was like seven people or so, business and IT. But over time, they became a bit bigger. So they became eight, nine, ten, sometimes even bigger. And there was just a lot of communication overhead in these teams. I think if you heard Sander talk about micro teams, if you have two or three people together, you can imagine you can be fairly effective in your communication. But if you have 12 people, you just spend a lot of time just explaining stuff to each other that maybe not everybody's interested in. So there was a lot of overhead. Um, what you also saw is that we kind of cut up the organization in these teams of, of seven people or so. Um, and we had quite a lot of people, actually. So what you saw is that we had multiple teams actually working on, on one product or customer purpose. So that was spread. And we started optimizing for the purpose of that squad. 
Well, actually, the purpose was developing a product or something for the customer. So again, a lot of alignment between all those teams working on the same uh, purpose. Um, and the squad, uh, so it's quite important in this concept. Squad had to have autonomy, super important. They had to have a purpose. People would be there, they would be happy, but it became a bit of a family, a bit of an institute. So people actually never left the squad anymore. Yeah? And it's, I, I think it's healthy to have stable teams, but stable teams for the rest of your life, maybe not that healthy. Um, so we started really optimizing for the squad. The squad really became the meaning in itself instead of the product or the customer. And with that also came some challenges in scalability and flexibility. And so basically the answer to every new request or new prioritization or whatever was, we have to add people to the squad or we have to add squads. That was kind of, and this didn't scale because we had like 2,000 engineers already then, so we were not going to add a lot more. And what you also saw is we, we tried to put everything in those squads, the dev, ops, business, and people actually had to know everything, like from the infrastructure and the network up until the, the APIs and the front ends, everything. And also that did not sc really scale that well. So we sh you saw that we had challenges of in these squads, although in, in my opinion they were too big, to have all that knowledge in those squads to be productive. And I think also we have to realize that, you know, this is seven years. Eh? Since 2015, it is seven years ago. That's a lifetime, right? It's a lifetime in engineering. And actually, Spotify, uh, where we kind of got the inspiration from, did that two years before. That's nine years ago. And if then I try to translate this a bit to you people in the room here, mostly in engineering, and I try to plot this on the front-end frameworks, probably you started somewhere with AngularJS, moved to React, tried some Vue, some Angular, some Polymer, and maybe you ended up with lit HTML like we did. So that's in the same time frame. Eh? So you better have been improving our way of working as well. So let's go back to the journey. Uh, so 2018 is where the journey begins in daily banking. And I arrived in this department. I came, came from the analytics department, so I did big data and streaming analytics, that kind of stuff. And I, I came to daily banking and thought, how difficult can it be? And we built digital flows here for our customers. It's an API, it's a front end, let's go. And after six months in the job, we finished our first flow. I was super happy we finished our first flow. But I, then I found out it actually took us 18 months to build that flow, API in the front end. And I thought, okay, I saw this pile of about 70 other flows we still had to do sitting next to me. I thought, okay, this is not going to scale. And that's why we need to do something here. We need to start improving. And the first thing I started with is looking at the technology. And I got some inspiration there from, for example, Gene Kim, Accelerate. I looked more at the level of the teams, the technology. Um, and it's good, I think, to know the context. In this domain, people in the past worked with TIPCO. That's something we use within ING. And some at some point in time, we got a bit less connected with TIPCO, let's say, as a company, so we start stopped using it. Um, and that was about the time when I came into this department. And we just had developed the first API. Um, but people really still kind of connected to this TIPCO. So I really had to contain uh, this. So I contained the legacy. I actually literally withdrew the rights from the engineers to TIPCO to really move them to Java, which was our target. And we defined a clear target. So APIs in a, a bit of a proprietary ING framework in Java with standard front ends at that point in time. Angular, now it's something else. So we moved uh, probably two uh, frameworks uh, down the road uh, now. And we had to start moving. And, and next to this, obviously, the people had to grow the skills. Yeah? So not everybody was, uh, was a uh, proficient engineer in Java uh, or in the front-end technology would use. So we scaled up the engineers. So we planned mastery days. I think Hoda still knows them from uh, the analytics times, uh, where I also implemented this. It's a f once every four weeks or so. This is a moment where uh, you know, people learn, share, do stuff together. We had chapter time, you know, several hours every week. We had personal training, everything to get really acquainted to the technologies. And we also started steering on the solutions in the architecture because this was a bit new. Also, the architecture moving a bit more to a microservice architecture was new. So there was a strong cooperation with the architects and we have feature engineers to help the teams really make this, uh, make this move. And we handed out Max, obviously. Um, and that was you know, perfect. And I thought, okay, let's go. But then uh, we crashed and burned a bit. So um, we had this pipeline migration, and before we had Nolio, I don't know if you know it, it's a bit an unsigned pipeline uh, of uh, computer associates, and we moved to TFS, which is from Windows, it's basically, uh, that's how these days it's Azure DevOps, with Ansible, and that was uh, the stuff we would use to uh, define the deployments. Um, and I told the product owners, don't you worry, it's a small pipeline migration, it's easy, we'll do this. And my background was here again, the data domain, we deployed full Hadoop clusters with Ansible, I thought, how difficult can it be to deploy a Java API? 
But um, I told them a few sprints. It took us six months, or I think a bit more even in some teams. And what I learned there was that, one, we just had a lack of expertise. People just did not know about Ansible. They didn't know how to kind of automate, uh, automate the deployment of their application. Um, and I thought, you know, it's, it's a war file we deploy on a TC server, right? How difficult can it be? But still, I think we, we managed to have 25 different ways of deploying that war file on a TC server in every single team. So we were really reinventing the wheel all over the place. So this didn't really uh, work well. And then we were in this people transition. So we were trying to get people to the level of Java where we needed them to get. And we were investing heavily. But we were not really getting the productivity. I think Sander told me I should not talk about productivity. But still, we looked a bit at the figures. And there was that, not that much of that uh, big pile of, uh, of flows, let's say, uh, getting into production. So we were not really getting there. So we really had to raise the bar in terms of, you know, I think, the people and the skills uh, we needed. So this is, I think, a moment where I was so successful in failing that ING actually promoted me to IT lead. Um, <laughs> And I was able to hire a new IT area lead. And uh, now I had to talk with uh, Marcin. I knew three things. One, I found my IT area lead. Really good. Uh, two, I had found a buddy in this continuous improvement journey. Because I was on a journey with this department. I was just, I think, one and a half year on the way. I just had epically failed. And I thought, OK, but we need to continue this journey. So I think that was good. And, and two, and, and three, I already knew this would be a very interesting journey where Marcin is going to tell you a bit more now. Right. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so actually this journey starts here at GoTo in 2019, where uh, together with a colleague, I hosted a talk called the death of the IT manager. So, sorry, this is death in, in here. But uh, it's basically about being a, a lead developer uh, in, in, in a modern organization. And then after the talk, I wandered off into GoTo, checking out other uh, time slots. And by sheer coincidence, I got into another time slot, by this guy. So your former keynote speaker from an hour ago. And in his former talk, hi, Sander, uh, basically he talked about a um, small world after all, um, about how software development got complex over time. And that we, what he called it, I quote, suck at predicting. Uh, that, that all these things that we work with to get, uh, as, as software developers got so complex, you just cannot know everything. In fact, he mentioned it today as well. And actually, I just, got, I just heard actually a, co a couple of days earlier that I became the uh, head of IT and took, um, took Heise's job. And um, I thought, well, those concepts of simplicity, of actually working in small teams on whatever is important at that very moment, sounded great. And that's how it all started, with microteams. Because back at ING, at that time, we had, as Gijs mentioned, teams of 10, 12, 14 people optimizing to prolong their own existence with, uh, on team level, roadmaps spanning over multiple years. Um, everything for the, for the long-lasting, agile purpose of that very moment, of that very team. So I thought, OK, how about we just exchange these large teams with this long-lasting purpose for small teams? with no purpose, but working on the most important thing at this very moment for your organization. So now you all, from the small startups here, you think, OK, what is this guy talking about? We all just have 10 people, and we are working at whatever is most important thing at this moment. Yeah, OK. But you haven't seen a large organization, all right? So um, small teams with no purpose, that, that sounded really nice. So in 2019 and, and, and 2020, uh, I implemented uh, the notion of micro teams uh, based on the Saunders talk at, at um, current accounts and savings at ING. Um, other departments followed. Uh, basically, I, hold a, I wrote a whole white paper and a, and a deck with, with detailed information how s something like that could work at ING in a complex ING ecosystem. So basically, what I broke down to high level, split up big teams. So in every teams with in every team with four, more than four developers, we deducted the access developers. So let's say teams that went from four, from six, seven, eight developers went to four. And actually, what, what we expected actually happened. The teams that went from six to four or seven to four experienced zero or near zero velocity loss. So it's simple, but it's true. The mythical man month is true. Once 
past a certain threshold, it makes absolutely no sense to add more people to a team because people will just orchestrate the work and talk about the work rather than doing the work. Remove, remove purpose on team level. So that not, has not so much to do with micro teams, but it was an issue for us at that, at that moment. And that's, that's hard. That's hard because if you're as, a, as, as an organization, if you promote the, the, the idea of autonomy, of having a purpose as a team, and people work like that for a couple of years, it's hard to, to basically come, go and say, well, that, that purpose on team level, we should do no purpose. Right? Full focus on feature creation. So what does that mean technology and from a technology perspective? So that's actually only building features without the plumbing. So as Gijs just mentioned, micro teams should not migrate from one pipeline to another. It should just be made for them. And then, my favorite, seems obvious, all teamwork, all IT work is in code. Right? So it's basically the shift left maneuver. All IT work that people on dev of development contracts should be in code. Of course, we all know code should all be in version control. If your work, IT work, is not in code, it's most probably waste. OK, so before we go into the details how that works, um, just a side note. Um, the, the Micros team concept will never get off, will never, get, will never take off if you haven't um, prepared yourself for it as an organization. So ING invested a lot of time, a lot of money um, to create a touchpoint tribe that offers things like Kafka event bus as a service, Cassandra key space as a service, Oracle databases as a service. We have a very well functioning global data lake, authentication, authorization means that come out of the box that the teams don't have to create themselves. Without this, that will never get off, this, uh, this, this, the, the notion of micro teams. So, I always like these two books. Let me get some drink. Mm. Because if you want to improve your organization, the, 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 the core concept in this book, so sorry for, for those who haven't read it, a bit of a spoiler alert. By the way, uh, on the top right says culture. Uh, all improvements in your organization should go along these three axes, right? Flow, feedback, culture. Where flow is really in the creational part of software development. It's, it's, it's the coding itself. From development to production, trunk-based development, continuous integration, pipelines as code, and basically everything up till the moment that code lives somewhere on an integrated environment can be production. And then the feedback, I, I, re I really like these, these this, this concept. So I've, uh, the feedback is basically af af everything after you have deployed your code. Right? It's monitoring, alerting, logging, code scans, OWASP checks. And there's the culture. Engineering culture, we all know and love. One learning organization, the Google 20%, mastery time, postmortems, things like that. So this is how I always try to operate when improve some kind of environment along the flow, feedback, and culture. So the micro teams I created, sorry for the typo in Azure DevOps, by the way. Uh, the core of it evolved around, um, well, the shift left maneuver, right? Because the, um, the, the combination of Azure DevOps and OpenShift proved to be a, a really strong, strong asset, right? So uh, code is deployed on Azure OpenShift based pipeline, OpenShift. Uh, powered cloud, and code is deployed into immutable containers. So as I said, teams were small, ideally three to four, deve to four developers. Testing is automated on code level. APIs and their consumers are tested in containers as well. We call that bank and box. And contract testing for real critical services. And as I said before a couple of slides ago, Highly standardized ING stack, right? So no own plumbing, no own um, pipeline building, tool, tooling scripts or whatsoever. Then all your efficiency goes out the door. So in, in essence, micro teams are assembly lines. So not like a factory worker assembly line, but like an assemblage, putting together, right? So where each engineer refines, codes, tests, deploys, the whole bunch. And then, a real important thing, they work according to a value chain. 
rather than a narrow, long-lasting purpose. So that means that this team mission, because at some point I, I went to call it mission, not purpose, they can change, and a team can dissolve itself because the work is done, or be reallocated to some other work because commitments change. And that ties into product thinking. Because where did that purpose go? How do these thing, teams know what to do? So we abstracted it to a level above. And this is the, a, a, a funny depiction of, well, communication lines between teams in, in, in most tribes, right? Um, and basically what happens is that these teams are optimizing their backlog for the team purpose, like we know, uh, but they negotiate their priorities. Uh, and manage their dependencies with the whole IT stack and the whole IT landscape, the other teams within the tribe, which is basically causing, well, dependency domino, right? Who knows dependency domino? Everyone. And then communication results in even more communication. And actually, you end up with something along the lines of that the teams are behaving as if they're a small startup, autonomous startup within a larger scale-up because then the tribe calls itself also, of course, a startup, which is, of course, it's not, right? Because by that time, it has 250 FTEs, so it's largely, a, it's not a startup, right? It's a scale-up. But all these teams are acting and competing with each other like they were, like they were a startup. So in 2021, in the Daily Banking Tribe, we implemented, according to the inspired book from Marty Kagan, we were inspired by inspired, um, something like value streams. And value streams were actually abstracted from team level to product level, to value chain level, right? Where you had one product backlog and several micro teams assigned to the product backlog. And also reallocated from the product backlog to another backlog. So the priorities were, went on to product level, right? Basic, uh, based on the life cycle of a product or service or a program um, and then, well, when the program ended, so most often the funds ended, uh, well, those teams can be reallocated to another stream, right? And you have a couple of streams, or let's say five, six, seven, eight streams, depends on the, 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 the growth of a, of a tribe. Um, but the teams are dynamically allocated and reallocated to all the work. And something that's really important, especially for management, a value stream can end. Right? So its backlog doesn't have to mean that it will prolong its own existence. In fact, a value stream should end at some point, right? because the work ends, because the digital flows have been, have been delivered, and, and at some point you don't need uh, six, seven, eight teams on the same project. When the project starts, you need all the teams in the world, but then at some point you need maybe one or two teams to just upkeep the, the flows and do some cosmetic changes. So wait, back to tech. Mm. So what happened to ops, right? Because I just said it's a, sh it's a shift left maneuver and everybody deploys their code. So what happened to the ops, the proverbial ops engineer? So I know it's 2022, and you all have moved to containers, immutable containers and cloud. Did you? Really? Are all your teams in your organization working in Kubernetes, OpenShift, or something like that? Or, 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 or AWS, something like that, cloud native, really? Do you still have virtual machines, teams, patting virtual machines on team level in your, in, your, in your department? If so, change that now. Because for us, it actually meant the combination, again, of, of OpenShift and, and uh, Azure, it meant 62% deployment speed improvement, right, in the, in the new technology. And then, uh, most importantly, we only needed devs. We had just no ops. At some point, we had no ops. No ops capacity. And that was all fine. Nothing broke down. So that capacity, we could actually rehire for coding capacity. So where did the ops go? Because still this cognitive load, is this work exists, still exists, right? Somebody needs to create the deployment pipelines. Somebody needs to set up the, uh, the OpenShift uh, uh, space, right? Somebody needs to uh, set up the access for it, to that, for the teams. Um, somebody needs to uh, uh, create those pipelines as code and put them in Git. Who does that? Well, that's 
the job of the platform team, right? Where indeed they set standard in scripted pipelines to put them in Git for you reuse and scalability by the micro teams. And they set up this cloud envir environment for the micro teams. And, and they also create the base Docker images. And they patch them, and not the team. The team works on features. And then they also set up the Azure stack in Grafana, Kibana, Prometheus alerts, ready to use for the micro teams. And then they're knowledgeable about Kubernetes, OpenShift, Docker, all that sweet stuff. So they write documentation and do some evangelism towards the micro teams. So your proverbial ops colleague is, in fact, the cloud engineer in the future. It's really important. And that ties into team topologies, right? So the, I think was the part of the people that, uh, that sat down at some, at some point, the largest part of the people. Um, team Topologies uh, is an excellent book by uh, Matthew Skelton, Manuel Pais, which at the moment gets implemented in ING Netherlands uh, in, in several departments, these concepts. I'll outline these concepts shortly. In their book, they, they talk about stream-aligned teams, enabling teams, complicated subsystem teams, and platform teams. So you already see that the stream-aligned team is, in, in fact, ties really well into the micro team. They're small, well, at least for me, they're purposeless, although that book says nothing significant about the, the, the purpose of a team. Uh, well, they're stream aligned, they're aligned to some kind of work, and well, basically they create features, right? And then you have platform teams who standardize, prevent plumbing, and offer their work as a service in a cloud environment or site reliability engineering towards the micro teams. And then you have subsystem teams, which is a bit of a special beast, because subsystem teams is, is for example, something like a uh, custom framework that you absolutely need in order uh, to uh, keep up your, uh, your, your critical business service or your IT service. So um, if, if that is something really custom that you, that you need for some, sort of some, for, for some specific reason, that could be a subsystem team. I have one of such teams. And then there's enabling teams which are often misunderstood, I, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I see, um, for platform teams. But in fact, enabling teams enable the micro teams, but for a small period of time, for something that is, well, I would say, fairly standardized and maybe repetitive. Think something like a migration from frame, framework A to framework B, uh, some kind of lifecycle management work on the APIs. So they fix that problem, and they ideally then should dissolve themselves. So I think you should not have too many enabling teams. Otherwise, you, apparently, you have a lot of problems. So um, putting it all together, what did team topologies, shift left, micro teams, product thinking bring us at daily banking? So I already mentioned this, 27% more backlog items done, measured in per year in 2020, 2021. More coding, because well, basically, we didn't have the creation of pipelines. We didn't have the, uh, uh, the, 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 the petting of uh, virtual machines. So more coding per team, more team members coding as well. Reuse of skills. At some point, we had just four operations engineers, actually cloud engineers, servicing over 100 developers, more than 20, 24 teams. And no more VM. I'll keep repeating this. No more VM, less infra cost, no patching. More security, you cannot log into an immutable container. And also less issues when auditing the stacks, right? Those of you who manage a, a, a highly regulated organization, a department in the organization know, auditing is hard on VMs. Containers built faster. Now, of course, I know a couple of team members in the audience uh, of my department will say, yeah, if it works. So yes, if it works, uh, the, the, and, and there is no queuing on the, on, the, on the Azure Cloud, yeah, then, and it's 62% uh, improvement of the speed. So we have our problems as well with that, but still, most of the time, it really works. And it's much, much faster uh, than before. So the combination of OpenShift and Azure, which basically results in many, many more releases, over 50% release increase, right, in 2020 and 2021. Platform teams, so on top of the other benefits, 
6% more coding time for feature teams. Why? Because this is your time to set up the, uh, the cloud environment, to manage access, to uh, build the pipeline itself. It's all that time in the teams that the, that the micro teams didn't have to do anymore. And now is my favorite. Work on important stuff and reallocate people to more important stuff, right? Or just dismantle a team. All right, now my clicker doesn't work. Oh, yeah. And by the way, should you wonder uh, how uh, I, I got all these uh, stats? So this is a, a, a subject of a whole uh, talk in itself, but uh, so I, I won't go into, uh, too deep into this, but um, you should implement Dora metrics, basically to close the loop on the observability of your team's performance, right? Because how do you know that, that, that your teams are doing well as, as outside of a gut feeling, right? Outside of uh, ma managing by walking around, which was basically impossible in, in the COVID time. So you should implement Dora metrics. Uh, Azure has this uh, uh, dashboard, uh, dashboard feature where you could add w widgets to it to basically know what's going on. Um, Dora metrics are also described uh, in detail in the DevOps handbook. You should do it. All right, so have you reached Mars in 2022? There's more cognitive load that you can remove. At some December morning, 2021, I sat behind my, uh, my, my computer after a, a, an outage in, in one of my teams, and I wanted to check out um, the Grafana board because to just see what was going on. And then I logged in, and uh, it was empty. So there was nothing to see. It was broken. <laughs> OK, well, can happen. And then I logged into another one, and that was just showing data from one data center, but not the other. Uh, OK. And then I tried another one. It was a broken link. And during the day, I kept trying all the dashboards from my teams. And well, I think well, maybe 40% at least of them were broken or showing no data or wrong data. So I thought, OK, uh, this is maybe the dark side of, of, the, of the concept that I introduced. We should take site reliability engineering more serious. Right? It's not an add-on to a micro team. Right, so that's, that, that was the, a, a, a lesson learned for me. So I, then I reread the book, Site Reliability Engineering, and basically um, in, in the first 10 or, or, or 12 chapters, they really outline, the Google really outline what's, what's, what, is, what it's all about. So basically, we moved to the 2.0 platform team, where, they, uh, where the platform team ex, uh, not only builds the site reliability toolkit stacks for the teams, also takes the whole responsibility for SRE from the teams. And this, you know, if you look at, if you look at it, it's quite logic, right? Because they, they, they create features. And, uh, as, and RTK stacks, site reliability engineering, is a, is, a, is a trade, is a craft in itself. So it was quite naive of me, actually, to think that that, would also, that also could be added to, the, to building features, right? So they do standby incidents and fix non-applicative issues with redeployments. So basically, every uh, outage that can be fixed with a redeployment uh, is fixed by the platform team, not anymore by the, uh, by the micro team. And they have monitoring responsibility over the whole department. OK. Talent density, uh, before we go to, uh, to Gijs. Um, so all these concepts are really nice, uh, but before you get into that, you need to have a brutally honest conversation with yourself and with your, with your engineers about talent density, right? Because then the, in the No Rules Rules book of, of Netflix, at some point uh, they, they have a, a story about the early uh, zeros and the, where in the dot-com crash, yes, Netflix is that old, um, they had to lay off half of their staff and just, just kept the best people. And they write in the book that after they laid off half of their staff, they st uh, staff, they still did the same amount of work. That's actually true, and especially now in the, uh, the great resignation, where I, I keep repeating that a, a senior software developer performing well in your organization is and will be a luxury item, right? So it's not a commodity, it's a luxury item. You should be happy that they, they want to work for you, not the other way around. So it might be uh, something sounding really obvious, but it, it's really true, even more true uh, when you implement micro teams, platform teams. Guys. Cool. Thanks. 
So this was obviously, this was at scale, right? So this was daily banking. Yeah, but we have more departments, right? So we thought we can do more. Um, and then I think you start really talking about uh, change management. Eh? So this is about changing an organization. Um, and I'm definitely not going to claim that I'm an expert in change management or in uh, changing an organization. I learned a bit from Simon van der Veer. He coached me a while. He wrote a very extensive book about it, if you want to read. It's a bit of a tough read, but it kind of covers everything you want to know about organizational uh, change. And I think what I want to share here today are two things we did to scale this across daily banking, but also across the other teams. Um, and one is that you have to be patient. And so this is a four-year journey or so, and we're still not there. So this really takes time. This is not something you do in half a year, and it also heavily depends on where you are with your organization. So this really takes time. Um, and you need to create an environment for change. And I will share a few examples of what we did here. I create an environment for change so the organization starts changing itself. Because it doesn't scale if you just have to tell every individual in the organization what they have to do. It needs to come from the organization itself. So creating an, uh, an environment for change is communication, communication, communication. So what we did we do? Basically, based on what we were doing in daily banking, together with the rest of my team, we started creating a vision and a strategy like, OK, and we called it our Mars mission. You heard it a few times already. We said, OK, where do we want to be three years from now? And we built this together with mostly our chapter leads, our IT area leads. Um, and we communicated this to the organization. And that's beautiful. But obviously, this is a okay, nice story. And then let me go coding again. I think you know uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, and we've made some nice pictures with it as well, but still. Yeah. So we thought, OK, we need to go one level deeper to really get this into the organization. So we started developing our manifesto for us as a department. We did this together with our engineers, chapter leads, everybody. We started making really sharp, OK, if this is our vision, where do we want to be two, three years from now? What does it mean? What does it mean about people? Uh, talent intensity, I think, like Martin explained. What does it mean about how we work? Well, I think you've seen some examples of that in the last uh, slides. What does it mean about our architecture, our design? What does it mean about the technology we use? And we made that very, uh, very clear. And we kept communicating about it to the teams. Then the clicker doesn't work. Ah, there we are. And this was kind of a one-off. So we rolled this out. We, we discussed with it in every chapter, et cetera. That's what we did. We thought we need to kind of keep, keep the communication going. So we set up uh, three meetups. They take place on a monthly basis. And they have a specific uh, target group. And we took a bit of inspiration from uh, SpaceX and their Mars mission. Um, and we said, OK, everybody can join here. So every 400 people or 450 people, actually, the rest of ING can join. But there is a certain focus. So we have this Starship design session where we mostly discuss more the development topics. So do we use Java or Kotlin, you know, GraphQL, APIs, whatever new developments that, uh, that happen. We have mission control. This is for the SREs. So I think the people that disappeared in the story of Martin, a few of them are still there, and they do SRE. So they also need to learn and share. And we have ITS. It's more for the architects and the feature engineers. It describes a bit the overall mission and what we do there. And this we have kept going until today. And it, I think it really helps to keep the keep the momentum going and keep the communication going. And I think the second point is this environment is not an IT-only environment. And so uh, I'm sitting there and Martin is sitting there with our business counterparts. So if I just start talking about Azure DevOps and ICHP and all that, they, you know, they will disconnect kind of at some point in time. So we really had to translate this into more tangible stuff for our colleagues, like, OK, you know, how are we going to bring back the customer focus with this? How are we going to introduce real product thinking? Because this is not something the engineers do, eh? the products we develop with our business colleagues. How are we going to help our P&L with this? You know, how are we going to create faster delivery? I think the figures that March and showed, they also really helped in convincing our, our, uh, uh, our business colleagues. And for example, what also really helped me is the book of Marty Kagan on product thinking. I kind of silently pushed this into the organization, gave it to some of my tribe lead colleagues. They started sharing. And one of the good things in that book is that it's really opinionated how business and IT should cooperate. And it values really, let's say, the role of IT in business, which I like, obviously. So I think it's a nice book uh, to share with your business colleagues. And then again, it's all about talent, talent density. Uh, so you can do a lot of stuff, but if you don't have the good people sitting on the floor, it's not going to fly. So we spend a lot of time actually on this talent density and how to create this over years. So we created an HR strategy depicting, OK, what's the kind of work we're going to do a few years from now, or actually maybe today, depending a bit on the department. What does that mean for you as an individual? Where do you have to grow as a developer, as an ops engineer, whatever? Um, and we also kind of defined a bar. Uh, so we used the name persona. So we said, OK, if you're a developer, 
what, does it, what do you need to be successful in this organization a few years from now? And gave people the choice, okay, we're going to help you develop there or not, and then we'll find something else, you know, where your skills fit better. Um, and in the hiring at that point in time, and I think we now use it a bit less with the overheated market, but when we could still use this, we use Codility to retest really the coding skills of people before they would enter uh, the company. I think then, uh, Martin, you can close it, right? I guess. Right, so before we uh, close, just a couple of messages to remember. So make teams small, their work simple, and dare to dissolve the teams if their work is done. Move to containers now. Uh, of course, all dev work should be in code. If your work is not in, in version control, it's probably waste. Beware of the team purpose on team level. Be patient, as Gijs said. Change takes time. Change is hard. I always say change is hard in an agile organization. I mean, how does that sound? Uh, and SRE, as we learned this year and last year, that's not an add-on or a consultant or uh, a, center, a center of excellence or something like that. It's really a trade, and, and it, it's, it's really important to have. Um, and all this that you hear today uh, works best in a, uh, a cloud stack, right? So, but I, I already has the, uh, the virtual machines uh, thing going, so. Good. And hand out developers a Mac. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool.